Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Alexander Studies Online blog and today I'm extremely pleased to be talking to Lisa Harris. She's um, an Alexander Technique teacher who qualified 10 years ago and as part of an MSc in positive psychology uh, she did a dissertation on, I'll just check the title, an exploration of embodied movement practices as a route to self-compassion based largely, I think, on her experiences of the Alexander Technique and um, its relevance to well-being. And um, so, anyway, welcome to the uh, virtual world of Alexander Studies Online, Lisa. I'm just going to ask you a little bit about your research. And I thought perhaps if we can structure it so that to begin with, um, I'll ask you a few questions about the background to the study and some of the sort of key concepts because embodiment, self-compassion, they're a little bit sort of woolly, aren't they? You know, so uh -huh. I'll try and talk about how they were defined in your work. Then um, talk a little bit more in detail, if you could, about the actual design of the study and then the findings and particularly anything that was very relevant to Alexander Technique teachers or practitioners or other people who might be uh, accessing the blog. Okay, what is self-compassion or how was self-compassion uh, defined in your work and why is it worthy of study? The way I uh, define self-compassion in my work was I, I um, used somebody called Christian Neff who is in the West, she's the big name in self-compassion or one of them. And she she defines it as being or containing three things, which are mindfulness, self kindness, and common humanity. So the mindfulness is is perhaps being so. For example, you, you've done something that's gone wrong. So mindfulness is being aware that if you start to say, "Oh God, I've I've done it wrong. I'm so useless," it's being being aware that that's happening. Um, self care or self kindness is is being talking to yourself actually as though you might talk to a friend, you know, would you treat, treat a friend that way? Probably not. And the common humanity is recognising that we all have those moments where we think those kinds of things. It, it's not in isolation. It is all of us. So that, that was, that was how I approached it. Use that, that um, uh, exposition of, of self-compassion. Um, it's worthy of study because, um, in general, because if those who are self-compassionate have high health, have high well-being. Um, and I thought for Alexandra it was worthy of, of study because those two concepts hadn't really been put together. I couldn't find anything that put them together. And I thought it would be interesting to see what, what I could find out about. And so I chose embodied practices because, I mean, perhaps I could have done uh, an experiment or something, but... One, I didn't want to. I wanted to do reading and research. And two, it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I thought, you know, it's just going to be so hard trying to get a sensible thing going. Actually, I'm going to do a review um, and I will use embodied practices instead of Alexander Technique and then see if I can relate the findings back to Alexander Technique. Hmm. That makes some sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I think those kind of exploratory studies are, are so important as well. It's not just about doing, you know, sort of practical, experimental kind of stuff, is it? You need you need that sort of conceptual, yeah. theoretical and, and literary background, don't you? Um, and I think that that, you know, that sort of um, nice three part exposition of self-compassion is also very helpful this kind of theoretical models that give us sort of pegs and structures to yeah. hang our ideas on that re really so helpful that's great thank you and um how did your interest between um you no know, the link if you like your interest in the link between the alexander technique and self-compassion arise when i started my msc in positive psychology i wanted to explore how how the body affects well-being and that just followed from my own experience of, of learning and then practicing the Alexander Technique. Um, so my dissertation was definitely going to be about Alexander Technique and while I was thinking about what am I going to do, you know, it was supposed to be some fairly new research, somehow I just kept getting drawn to self-compassion. I just kept coming back and thinking, one day I just thought, you know, I keep coming back around to self-compassion, perhaps that's what I need to do. And so mm. I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, you're often in research, it's those little niggles, those ideas that just won't go to bed that sort of drives your work, isn't it? And I think that makes it more interesting. And, and yes, rather, yeah. yeah. Um, so what do you understand by the term embodiment? 
and what is its connection to self-compassion? Well, I, um, so before I started being an Alexander teacher, I thought about, you know, the mind and the body are one and, and that that kind of that we understand. Um, having done my research, I, I kind of understood more that the, the brain is not the only source of cognition we have. We understand things through our body um, and, and the brain is not our only source of knowledge either. I understood that more deeply. Um, so that's kind of my understanding of embodiment, that actually we take information into our bodies and it affects how we feel and um and i in positive psychology in general and in self-compassion I, I kind of felt that the body was a bit missing sometimes mm -hmm. um it's starting to be some there's some research um in in feelings where how we are in our body actually affects how how we feel you know in terms of happy and sad and it's not really that surprising but it's not really been looked at in the research and so i wanted to bring those two together yeah I think that's great. Yeah, I think generally there's much more of an emotional turn in, in research. You know, even sociologists, you know, talk about the body now. There's, you know, a whole slew of stuff on embodiment. It's just become much more um, interesting. And that, that sort of wider recognition, I think, of the importance of embodiment in, in, in everyday life. Yeah, great. OK, so we're going to move on now a little bit to the sort of details of how you went about designing the research. So an important thing, obviously, to start with is what was the key question or questions that you were trying to answer through your work? Can embodied practices on their own affect self-compassion? So when, when I started to look at the literature, quite a number of the studies had embodied practice with self-compassion meditation included and things like that and I was well if it's got self-compassion meditation yes it probably will improve self-compassion but thinking of Alexander technique which doesn't sort of explicitly include self-compassion as I've described it I wanted to just look at the, the embodied practices themselves so that that was what I wanted to do that does it or doesn't it you know <laughs> <laughs> okay fine okay. Uh, and how did you go about uh, obtaining data to answer your question well, I used, so there are a number of databases available to me because I was studying, um, and I used those to search for papers which looked at things like yoga, tai chi, qigong, and self-compassion or self-kindness, mm -hmm. or compassion, that, those kinds of things, and then you get a load of uh, information, you know, all these papers come through, so I then went through and looked, well, are they relevant, which ones are kind of quickly relevant, and, and I said, no, 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 no. And then I ended up with an, another set. And of those, I, I gave a more of a thorough looking through. And then some I discarded because, as I said, they, they were that include self-compassion meditation or they were on a variety of other things as well. Or they were just looked more at heart rate and things like that. So yeah. I ended up with a dozen, about yeah, a dozen, I think, Um studies to look at which were a mix some had quantitative data so mm -hmm. where studies have been done and they'd um had yeah numbers from things and um others had qualitative data so where they'd asked people their opinions mm -hmm. so i number crunched the the quantitative data to see whether or not i you know they all agreed and then i did um what's called a, um, a ta and I've forgotten what that stands for at the moment. <laughs> some, kind of a, some kind of a thematic analysis, maybe? Thematic analysis. I was going to say transactional <laughs> analysis. Guess, but that's all right. <laughs> thematic analysis. So where I went through all the all the words in the paper and pulled out what I felt were the relevant themes mm -hmm. across the papers. Um, and then having done that, I then kind of thought, well, does Alexander Technique relate to any of this? In what I've got on Alexander Technique, can I find links here to suggest that there mm -hmm. could be a correlation? Okay, great. So that's quite a complicated uh, form of analysis. It's quite challenging, isn't it, to bring together qualitative and quantitative data. Mm. Like that. So, uh, but, but it's necessary. <laughs> when you're doing that kind of exploratory work, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Um, and what, in your opinion, were the most important findings or insights that, that emerged? Well, I found that um, self-compassion did increase through doing embodied practices. Um, 
both in, in terms of the numbers that were that was perhaps not as much as the original paper suggested when I actually looked a bit more detail but nonetheless mm. there was a suggestion that it did increase and certainly in the the words that people said about self-compassion afterwards that that increased um I felt it was interesting that what came up that practice is an important factor so you know things like tai chi you can't just do it 10 times and be self-compassionate you have to keep doing it mm-hmm. um, and and that practice starts a process and the process is one of change mm-hmm. as we know from the alexander technique yeah um and because of the practice i guess time is a factor and the longer you do some of the practices the more embodied they become and then more natural those responses of self-compassion come mm-hmm. um I, I felt that embodied embodied learning was important it's it's so by learning self-compassion through doing a embodied practice you're not just learning it out of a book and that embodied learning was actually really important and part of that is the teacher embodying what they are teaching that the self-compassion actually brings about a number of other positive psychological benefits like optimism for example um, and, and it becomes an upward spiral. So it's not, you know, it's not just your self-compassion that increases, but mm. other there are other positive psychological benefits that become important. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's great. So I don't think any of this will be any massive surprise to Alexander Technique. Just te- so. out there. You know, there's so many parallels. I think that shows the, the value of your study, that uh, it is that kind of embodied aspect there. So um, on that note, is there anything from your study that you think would be of particular relevance or interest to the Alexander community? Well, I felt that, um, so how we behave affects others. So we all know that we need to be directing when we put our hands on in order to encourage their direction. But how we behave, how we talk to, perhaps to or about ourselves and what we've done outside of the Alexander lesson. Um, And so I think it's important that we practice Mm. self-compassion. because if we don't, I think with our hands on them, you know, if we if we got our hands on them and oh no, I didn't do that, it subtly that introduces that slight flight flight and fight response in us, which could go through our hands into them. That's not sure. ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, if we practice self compassion, it mediates both mindfulness um, and compassion for others. And I would argue they're both key things that we want to have when we're teaching. We want to be mindful. We want to have compassion for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and have, treating them with those th- that way also encourages their learning and we're teaching them so that's also good mm-hmm. um, so incorporating self-compassion could affect their learning and I'm not talking in a big way about going through well these are the three things of self-compassion but being kind to them so people turn up so oh, I haven't laid down this week so uh, well I'm saying well no, I do expect you to do your homework. If I give you, <laughs> just yeah. say, well, okay, you know, can, can you understand why you didn't? And is there something to explore there in your habits about your time management and who has your time? And so just approaching things in a slightly different way. Mm. Um, and, and when they, you know, you, oh, sorry, I'm helping you. That's okay. You don't have to say sorry. It's just noticing. It's that kind of stepping back yeah. from a sort of a traditional teachery role that you can. Yeah have um so i think those for me are the are the key the key things so the other i felt what my research did was it brought together evidence from a number of other alexander studies which showed that both self-kindness and mindfulness are often findings from them Mm -hmm. but the common humanity wasn't so much what i might call that isn't so common um and so therefore i felt that talking about our own experiences when learning Alexander technique might help people so saying that well it's okay if you're struggling with it you know I struggle with this too <laughs> sometimes yeah, yeah. I forget to sometimes I forget to free my neck sometimes I find my buttocks to clench whatever <laughs> it is because otherwise you know it's easy to be like this up here teacher and this down here and and that's that's that takes away the common humanity so I think if we can remember that we've got those three elements of self-compassion right there in Alexander technique we have, we have. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, really, really useful. We all need reminding, don't we? All of us. <laughs> yeah, but right. No, that's really helpful. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and 
what have you I know we've had COVID and one one thing and another and other things going on in our lives Has, have you done anything much with your dissertation have you got any plans for doing more things with your dissertation um I think when I wrote it I was I was considering doing a PhD and so I mm -hmm. I kind of set it up that there is you know that to say there's more research to do with the, the, mm -hmm. the intention that I might do it um but I think over time I've decided that I don't want to do that um but you don't, want has... to do it. you don't want to do it yet oh well that's for maybe <laughs> maybe i don't want to do it yet yes <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm interrupting <laughs> no no you're absolutely right maybe i'll change my mind. but uh, yeah i think no I, I didn't want to do that yeah i did think hard about it um but but no not at the moment but what it has done it studying it studying as i have has made me more self-compassionate mm -hmm. which has affected my relationships both within the Alexander Room and outside the Alexander Room. And it's changed the way I teach. So I can't kind of describe earlier on perhaps some of the changes, but I've really it's really changed the way I've teached to teach. Um I think much more kindly than perhaps I used to. Okay. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. Inter it's in, I, when I was reading your uh, dissertation a couple of days ago, uh, I sort of felt felt the the waves <laughs> sort of you know the influence. I said, oh, yeah, I need to be a little bit kinder to myself here. And then you know, stuff like that. so yeah, I mean, does it definitely when you're doing that kind of study, it does affect how you think and act. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to say in conclusion? Um, not particularly, other than I really enjoyed doing the research. It was amazing to read. Mm -hmm. um, about these other, you know, other embodied practices which aren't Alexander technique, and obviously they're all slightly different. But it was great fun. It was huge fun to do it, and I really enjoyed it. So mm -hmm. who knows about the PhD? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might get bitten by the bug again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm using it again for this. It's like, oh yeah, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so very much for talking to us. It's been an absolute thank pleasure, you. delight, yes, and um, hopefully we'll speak again at some point. Yeah, right. lovely. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.